Okay. Uh, well, our <clears throat> our co-director, uh, as if uh, Sam had probably with the connection. Uh, I would like to introduce the first uh, part of this meeting, which is about physiology, starting with Dr. Daniel Gold from John Hopkins University. Uh, the second speaker in this section will be my fellow Guillermo Salazar from uh, our foundation uh, of neurotology in Argentina. Dan, welcome. Are you ready? Thank you, I'm ready, yes. I will go ahead and share. All right, and can you can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, great, perfect, okay. Um, let me set my timer here, 30 minutes. I won't go over, I promise. So thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here, um, especially with such esteemed uh, faculty colleagues here. And um, it seems like it's about day 45 of the US election. So this is a very nice escape as well. So I'm happy to be doing this. So I did get permission to do sort of a, a general overview, more of a bedside examination of ocular motor and vestibular systems. There's a little bit of everything. This will be a nice introduction for everybody um, rather than sort of getting into the nitty gritty physiology. Um, so suit here and, and Asif did give me permission to do that. Um, I hope nobody gets mad at me. So some of you may have seen this lecture before. This is the, the new and improved 2020 pandemic version now with some virtual telemedicine pearls as well. So lots of videos. This is the first talk. Hopefully, hopefully nobody will be sleeping by the end of it. And um, let's go, let's, let's proceed. So what I'll be talking about is how do you examine the ocular motor system? Um, is this a central vestibular disorder or not? How do you examine the semicircular canals? How do you examine the utricles to diagnose and localize to differentiate a peripheral from a central disorder? Basically, um, by the end of this talk, you should understand that from the bedside exam, whether your, your patient's symptoms of dizziness and or imbalance are, are central or peripheral. If, if I have not achieved that, if that doesn't happen um, by the end of this, then that, that's probably my fault and not yours. So first we'll talk about the ocular motor system. So there are a lot of structures here, a lot of things going on in the posterior fossa and the cerebellum and the brain stem. We're, we're gonna to touch on the range of movements, fixation, gaze holding, saccades, pursuit, VOR suppression, convergence, optokinetic nystagmus. Why should we be checking these? Um, I'm not gonna get into all these individual structures, but there's a lot going on. There are these four structures that are responsible for gaze holding. There are these four structures in the cerebellum and the brain stem that are responsible for saccades. So there's a lot of overlap is the point I'm trying to make, a lot of overlap between the central utricle and semicircular canal pathways and the ocular motor pathways. So the knowledge of the anatomy and what's going on and, and knowing what you're testing for on your exam helps a lot with, with localization and with etiology. So what do we do? We wanna make sure that the range of eye movements is normal. We wanna look in um, straight ahead, right, left, up, down. You wanna make sure the eyes are steady in primary gaze as well. What about this? This is a patient who has a six nerve palsy. So knowledge of this motility problem of this abduction paresis in the right eye due to a right six nerve palsy is going to affect everything. If this patient also has dizziness, um, what if you decide to, to test the video head impulse test and you put V-hit goggles on and the, the camera is over the paretic right eye? Obviously that's going to affect things. That's going to to make these, these saccades to the right and the right eye very slow. So knowledge of the motility inductions is key. Ophthalmoparesis can be supranuclear as in PSP. It could be nuclear, it can be fascicular. It can be due to a, a peripheral nerve, six nerve palsy as in this patient, a vasculopathic palsy, neuromuscular as in myasthenia, myopathic as in thyroid eye disease. This will influence your entire exam. 
What about fixation? Is the patient able to fixate? Are the eyes nice and quiet and steady? This patient's eyes are obviously not. This patient has nystagmus. Here there's a, there's a slow phase. Whoops. There's a slow phase down. There's a fast phase up. This is jerk nystagmus, upbeat nystagmus. This is due to a, a Wernicke's encephalopathy. Whereas this patient has another form of nystagmus where again, the slow phase is the culprit but these are back to back to back slow phases giving a pendular appearance. This patient has oculopalatal tremor. What about psychotic intrusions? This isn't nystagmus. These are very fast eye movements in this case, horizontally back to back to back with no interpsychotic interval. This patient has ocular flutter that was post-infectious. What about gaze holding? In this situation, she looks to the right, there's right beating. She looks back to center, now there's rebound nystagmus. There's a reversal of that nystagmus. She looks to the left and it's left beating. She looks back to center and she's got rebound nystagmus. So gaze evoked nystagmus um, is going to be um, a, a key. It's going to suggest that the gaze holding machinery in the brain stem and the cerebellum is not working and that can have localizing value um, and, and look for rebound as well. If you're not sure if this is physiologic endpoint nystagmus or pathologic gaze evoked nystagmus, if you see rebound nystagmus like she has, watch this, right beating nystagmus, and now she looks back and it's left beating. If you see this, this is pathologic. This is not physiologic endpoint. Saccades are next. You care about the latency. So you ask the patient to make a saccade if 10 seconds pass, then you might think about a cognitive problem. You might think about a neurodegenerative problem. The accuracy is the patient um, going right to your nose. I like to sort of test saccades out to the right and to the left and back to my nose to check for accuracy. These larger amplitude saccades can be good for uh, evaluating conjugacy and velocity. If the, the adducting eye is lagging behind, that makes you think about an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, an INO, for instance. So in the virtual world, um, this, this can be tested for it with be a synchronous connection pretty easily. And I found this to be quite effective, checking for saccades in, in much the same way that I just did at the bedside. What about this patient? She has, this is in slow motion, by the way. So it's slow, but just look at the accuracy. It takes her two or three saccades to get from the right to center, two or three little saccades, one, one, two, three, little saccades to get to the center. When she looks to the right, they're hypermetric. So she overshoots the target to the right. And if you see this saccadic dysmetria, if you see this particular pattern, you're thinking about, in this case, a right lateral medullary syndrome or right Wallenberg syndrome, which in fact she did have. So these can be highly localizing as in this case um, with knowledge of the saccade pathways as they course through the brainstem and the cerebellum. What about smooth pursuit? You need a small fixation target. You have to go, go slowly. If you move really fast, then you're not really testing pursuit at that point. You're evaluating um, saccades and sort of other systems there. So what's an example of, of an abnormal, a, a saccadic or choppy appearance? This is the same patient who had the gaze of oak nystagmus who has a cerebellar degeneration. And you can see how choppy these eye movements are um, the, the pursuit gain is so low that she has to substitute saccades, and that's what gives it the choppy appearance. So when everything is saccadic, um, to the right, to the left, up, down, you're thinking about something cerebellar, you're thinking about the basal ganglia, you're thinking about Parkinsonism or PSP. Um, if it's asymmetric, if it's just to one side, then you're thinking about a lesion, a problem to that side, ipsy lesional. What about vestibulo-ocular reflex suppression, VOR suppression? This is a combined eye head movement. And pursuit and VOR suppression are usually both psychotic or both normal. The two usually go together with exceptions. In the virtual world, I found this to be very effective as well. Um, again, it's a combined eye head movement and, um, and, and the patient's just being asked to look right at the camera and if there's any a psychotic appearance, a choppy appearance, then it's probably impaired. Same patient with the gaze evoked and the same patient with the, the impaired pursuit, her VOR suppression is just as bad. She can't suppress her vestibulo-ocular reflex. Um, and so 
this will be the case. VOR suppression will look just as bad as pursuit unless there's no VOR to suppress. So think about canvas, think about cerebellar ataxia, neuropathy, and vestibular areflexia syndrome, where the patient has a cerebellopathy that's causing impaired pursuit and a vestibulopathy that's causing bilateral vestibular loss. So in that situation, the pursuit will look bad, but the VOR suppression can look quite good because there's no VOR to suppress. What about convergence? So this isn't so helpful in the vestibular evaluation, generally speaking. The near point of convergence, the point at which the patient sees two and one eye sort of drifts out, should be less than 10 centimeters. You need a small fixation target. Patients who have concussions or Parkinson's disease or PSP commonly will experience convergence insufficiency and, and binocular diplopia um, at near, but it can be helpful for vestibular patients. This is a patient who had a lot of upbeat. She's looking at near, she's looking at distance, very little. She's looking at near, she's got a lot of upbeat, she's looking at distance. She's looking at near. And so convergence really aggravates um, her upbeat. She just has a tiny little bit of upbeat at baseline, much more with convergence. This is a patient with a pilocytic astrocytoma in the posterior fossa. And um, again, it can increase, convergence can increase or provoke acquired nystagmus, commonly vertical or cause it tra to transition. Think about Wernicke's encephalopathy. It's also going to damp congenital nystagmus. So it's going to be less with convergence in congenital nystagmus. This is a true optokinetic um, stimulus. This is a full field visual stimulus that's going to induce optokinetic nystagmus. In the virtual world, this is a patient with a complete psychotic palsy. I asked her to look out the window and she can generate okay. the slow you phases, like your eyes but she can't stuck generate there. the fast phases. Her yeah. eyes get stuck yeah. to the right. Does it all the time. Okay. Like, um, so you can't generate the fast okay. phases, the saccades. If you can't generate and, and you the fast look, phases, you the saccades, then forward. you can't generate the optokinetic nystagmus. At the bedside, basically, we're looking at sort of the, the small stimuli, the slow phases are the, um, is pursuit, the saccades are the fast phases. I found this to be highly effective um, using a, a free app, um, and you can just use the optokinetic drum on the app and, and hold it right up to the screen. So you're giving a, a full screen uh, stimulus to the patient, which is, works out quite well. Uh, this patient is another virtual evaluation. This patient has normal horizontal optokinetic nystagmus. He has bilateral rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus lesions. The RIMLF, that's where the vertical burst neurons live for saccades. So he could only generate the slow phase, but he couldn't generate the fast phase, upward or downward. So optokinetic, nice, or optokinetic stimulus can be helpful in those kinds of situations. It allows for rapid assessment of saccades pursuit, conjugacy of saccades. Um, for instance, in INO, you'd be able to see that, that adduction lag quite well also. So now we're jumping ahead to the semicircular canals. So we're gonna talk about the visually enhanced VOR, the head impulse, dynamic visual acuity, head shaking, vibration. We're not gonna talk about the laboratory evaluation. Um, and, and I was supposed to talk about the physiology of the vestibular ocular reflex. So this is, this is sort of the clinical manifestation um, of that physiology. So what are we doing? This is the visually enhanced VOR. This is nice and slow. It's too slow really to, to isolate the VOR. This is using different systems. This is using the pursuit system. If the patient loses, if they have a vestibular neuritis on the right side, the good side, the left side can, can drive the response because this stimulus is so slow, so low frequency. So this isn't adequate to measure the VOR function. Instead, I'll get to the head impulse next. So this is a psychotic VVOR, visually enhanced VOR, because I said that this is a combination of pursuit and vestibular ocular reflex, if this looks choppy as it does, you see how choppy that is, then that tells you right off the bat without doing anything, without evaluating pursuit, without evaluating um, the VOR with the head impulse that both of them are going to be impaired. This is a patient 
who had a cerebellar degeneration due to canvas, cerebellar ataxia, neuropathy, and vestibular areflexia syndrome, where both pursuit and the VOR were both impaired. So abnormal VVOR, both of those are impaired. What about the head impulse? This is the great David Z doing a head impulse. And um, this is how you do it. And again, it's a high frequency movement. And in this situation, even the good side can't drive the response. Pursuit can't compensate because it's just too fast. This is how to do it. This is a normal response. The patient's eyes are right on the target, which is usually the examiner's nose. This isn't so great. This is the active head impulse test. You can't control the speed. You can't control the start and end position so well. Um, so I haven't found this to be very effective. If the patient has really severe, profound unilateral or bilateral vestibular loss, you might see a catch up, but otherwise this is, this is a challenging test to do at home. And this is a, a, a very um, effective test with a patient who has bilateral vestibular loss. And you can see that there are catch-up saccades to both sides, right and left. This is usually peripheral, but again, if this is unilateral um, and the patient has the acute vestibular syndrome, um, it's, it's usually a vestibular neuritis, but don't forget about the vestibular nucleus. Don't forget about a peripheral labyrinthine ischemia, which is usually accompanied by cochlear ischemia and hearing loss. Um, don't forget about other localizations um, that could be central. So this is not always peripheral. Dynamic visual acuity, you're having the patient read the eye chart. He could read the 2020 line, and now he drops one line to 2025. That's perfectly fine. You really shouldn't lose more than that. Um, and this is, again, best corrected acuity, both eyes open. doesn't matter. You just care about the relative drop, if there is one between static visual acuity and dynamic visual acuity. This can be done in the virtual world at home. It's a little bit more challenging, especially since you're not controlling the movement, the patient is. So if the patient does this and then stops and reads a line and then keeps going, it doesn't work out so well. But if the patient, if you can see that they're doing what they're being asked to do, then this can be effective uh, virtually. This patient who has oscillopsia, head movement dependent oscillopsia, um, who has bilateral vestibular loss. If you have bilateral vestibular loss, usually you're gonna lose four or more lines with dynamic visual acuity. With unilateral, usually two to three lines, it's gonna be worse horizontally, oftentimes with a unilateral vestibular loss. So removing fixation is very handy when we're looking at um, provocative maneuvers, um, which we'll go into next. So ways to do that, friends out goggles, Video goggles are highly effective. You can do the pen light cover test. This is being done virtually. If the patient's in person, you can do occlusive fundoscopy. You can cover one eye, have the patient cover one eye, and you're occluding the other eye um, by essentially shining the bright light with the ophthalmoscope. They can't see anything. Fixation's been removed, and you're using the, the magnification of the direct ophthalmoscope or whatever it is that you're using to really get a good look at the nerve and to see if there's any jiggling spontaneous nystagmus. So what about head shaking? This is a provocative maneuver that's going to bring out vestibular asymmetry if present about two to three hertz for about 15 seconds or so. And this patient has normal vestibular function. And at the end of the 15 seconds, nothing's happening. This can be done in the virtual world as well. Again, you're relying on the patient to do the head shaking as opposed to the examiner, but it, it can work out quite well. This is a patient who had a Ramsey-Hunt syndrome on the left months ago who compensated really well for it. And you couldn't see any right beating until you shook his head like I just did. In this situation, this is contralesional. So the slow phase is toward the paretic ear, fast phase away, contralesional. This is what you would expect in a peripheral disorder. For a central disorder, there are different patterns that you might see. One is, one is vertical or downbeat oftentimes. The other one is if you see a patient in the emergency department, they have right beating nystagmus, you shake their head, now it's left beating. That reversal is suggestive of uh, probably this is a central problem. Here's a patient with a cerebellar degeneration, head shaking, horizontal head shaking brings out a downbeat nystagmus, which she didn't have before. This is known as cross coupling. It was previously known as perverted nystagmus, which has sort of fallen out of favor. Also, if you see a robust head shaking nystagmus response without unilateral vestibular loss, 
think about something that's central. Like I said, downbeat, this cross-coupled response, reversal of spontaneous nice segments. You're thinking about some problem with the vestibulocerebellum, the, the nodulus uvula or the flocculus paraflocculus. What about vibration? This is a, a, a transmitted um, symmetrically and bilaterally. This is another nice way to bring out vestibular asymmetry. You can vibrate the right mastoid, the vertex, the left mastoid. And again, this patient or, or um, model um, this demonstration, there's no vibration induced nystagmus because he has a normal vestibular system. Compared to this patient, okay. I'm gonna be ready. who had a I'm left ready. vestibular neuritis just a couple days ago, and you can see the right beating nystagmus is really time locked to that vibration. You turn it off, it's gone back to this sort of very mild baseline I'm right beating. And now it's applied again, and it's really time locked to that. So again, it's going to be contralesional. The slow phase is going to go toward the paretic ear, the fast phase away. Okay, and whenever you're ready. In the virtual whenever. world, you can use an electric toothbrush. Sometimes that's that's helpful to um, if the patient doesn't have a vibration device around. So finally, the utricle, the otoliths. Um, so what can we do? At the bedside, we can measure the ocular alignment, look for a skew deviation. We can evaluate fundus torsion, a little bit more challenging, technically subjective visual vertical uh, from a lab standpoint. Mainly we're talking about the VEMPS, vestibular evoked my myogenic potentials, which I'm not going to go into. So this is me on my motorcycle. Um, as you can see, I look very comfortable um, on it. And so what, would, what happens if I go around a curve to the right side? Um, first of all, this is a really nice paper. It's about 25 pages of nothing but skew. It's a really great review, um, but it does need to be read about 57 times before it makes sense. Uh, but on that 57th, uh, 58th time you read it, you'll, you'll really enjoy it um, and appreciate it. So again, I'm going around a curve. Um, the, I'm tilted to the right going around that curve. So what happens? That tilt to the right is going to excite the right utricle as if I'm just simple, simply tilting my head to the right. The right eye is going to elevate and the left eye is going to depress a little bit, teeny tiny in a, in a normal person who doesn't have a pathologic ocular tilt reaction. Um, and there's going to be just a little bit of an ocular counter roll as well away from the head tilt. So a little teeny tiny minute skew deviation or skewing of the eyes, I should say, the eyes are going to counter roll a little bit. Um, this is the normal physiologic ocular tilt reaction, but the biggest component is actually a, a head tilt, a, a tilt of the head back to gravitational vertical like this. So because that little bit of skewing of the eyes is so small, because the ocular counter roll is, is relatively small, mainly people compensate by trying to reorient the head with the head tilt back to gravitational vertical. So then if this patient with the left lateral medullary Wallenberg syndrome, she has not, not a peripheral utricle injury, but a central utricle pathway injury as the utricle fibers go from the labyrinth on the left side into the, the lateral medulla. So it, it almost feels to the brain like in this situation, there's a, a decrease in tone of the left utricle pathway there's sort of a relative increase in tone in the right utricle pathway. It feels to the brain like you're tilting your head a little bit to the right side. So the brain's trying to get back to gravitational vertical. So if you think you're tilted to the right, you're going to try to straighten up or go to the left. The problem is that this patient is already straight up. So what happens is they go to the left. They go too far. They're trying to compensate um, but it's, it, it's, it's not working out well. So number one, the pathologic ocular tilt reaction, you're gonna see a head tilt. Number two, you're gonna see the skew deviation. One eye is gonna be much higher than the other eye. They're gonna have vertical diplopia almost all the time. Number three is this ocular counter roll. So um, the eyes are going to be in this situation, it's a right hyper, it's a um, left head tilt, and the eyes are going to roll in the direction of the head tilt and everything else. So how do we evaluate this at the bedside? This is a patient with acute vestibular syndrome. Our fellow is just simply doing alternate cover tests. This patient has just a little bit of a horizontal and exo deviation. The point here is that many normal people have small horizontal deviations. If the eyes are outward and coming in, that's an exo. If the eyes are 
or crossed and coming out, that's an E. So the point here is that neither of this is a, is a skew deviation. There's no such thing as a horizontal skew. This is perfectly normal. This is a negative test of skew in the HINTS exam in a patient with the acute vestibular syndrome. Measuring alignment works out quite well um, virtually and um, the, the spoon, it works out very well as an occluder. The spoon works to, to check temperature sense as well. So it's a, it's a great tool um, in the virtual world. Everybody has a couple of them around the house. This patient has the acute vestibular syndrome and this is a skew. You see that large vertical movement. The right eye is gonna come way down, left eye is gonna come up. The right eye is gonna come way down. This is a skew. This is a hypertropia that this patient has. And when you see a, a, this hypertropia, vertical diplopia, it could be a skew in a patient with acute dizziness and vertigo, consider it a skew until proven otherwise. So what about fundus torsion? This is, we have a really nice non-midriatic fundus camera that we can just snap a photo of our patients. And this is the, the fovea, the angle between the fovea and the optic nerve should look like this. We, we, we know what normal is. You can measure the angle between the two. This is a six-year-old who had a stroke that involved the interstitial nucleus of Cajal, which is part of the utricle ocular motor pathway. And this patient had a big left hyper, a big right head tilt, and a big in cycloduction of the left eye and an ex cycloduction of the right eye. This is ocular counter roll. This is, um, is, is easily picked up with fundus photos it's harder to, to evaluate for at the bedside without um, other tools. Um, and again, it, it's usually seen with a skew, it's usually seen with a head tilt, it's usually seen with other features of the ocular tilt reaction. What about the subjective visual vertical, the bucket test? This is such a simple, nice test. I wish I had invented it, um, but I've only constructed one myself, but it's a really nice test. And basically you're putting the patient's head into the bucket um, you're holding it so that um, they can't hold it. They're not giving themselves any proprioceptive cues. You're putting the head in the bucket so there are no visual cues. And basically what you're doing is you're asking the patient when this, this line is perfectly vertical to them, you're measuring their perception of vertical to actual earth vertical. We can measure with a protractor and a weighted string on the back what is actually earth vertical. And this is a really nice, easy way that costs five American dollars to make easy bedside measurement of, of subjective visual vertical, which can really come in handy. So this is a patient, a good example. So he had an ocular tilt reaction. He's got a big right head tilt and he had a skew deviation with a left hypertropia. He had an, the expected ocular counter roll toward the right ear. Everything kind of goes in the same direction. I asked him if he had taken any photos recently. And in fact, he did. He took a picture of his front door. He's trying to get a new front door and so you can see this is a consequence of his perception of this over here being earth vertical. Everything is going to be tilted in his world. He thought that this was earth vertical, but it's not. So what happened when we put this patient's head in the bucket, his perception of earth vertical was tilted way to the right side, toward the side of, of, of the head tilt as well. So think about the SVV as the perceptual consequence of the OTR, the ocular tilt reaction. And it's going to be abnormal with an acute unilateral vestibular loss like a vestibular neuritis, but not nearly as much as it is with a central utricle pathway lesion. The magnitude of the SVV tilt is gonna be much larger with a central lesion. So I'm not gonna talk much about, I've got two slides on positional vertigo. I know there's gonna be they're excellent um, clinicians who are gonna talk about BPPV who know a lot more about it than I do. But just another little virtual pearl here, the Dix Hall Pike can be done quite easily um, from home in the virtual world. Um, the, the roll test can be done quite easily as well. And, and so this is a pretty easy diagnosis um, to make even, even in the era of COVID if, if you're not seeing your patient in person. One thing I did see a couple days ago that I just wanna point out, this is a patient who had a cerebellar ataxia, known cerebellar ataxia. She's seated there. You can see the, 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 um, the goggles camera over the right eye. You can see the room camera. She's upright, she's in the dark, and she has no spontaneous nystagmus with fixation removed. And now we put her into a prone position. 
And it's bringing out a lot of downbeat nystagmus. This is a patient who had psychotic pursuit. She had gaze evoked nystagmus. She had clear features of a, a cerebellopathy. There's a right beating component as well. She doesn't have unilateral vestibular loss. So it was thought that this was sort of a, a, a central imbalance as well. Um, and the other thing that she had was she has, this is a left supine roll. She's lying down 20 degrees flexed, 90 degrees to the left, and she's got a right beating nystagmus. Apogeotropic beating towards the sky. Now she's in right roll and she has a left beating nystagmus. Again, apogeotropic beating up toward the sky. So don't assume that everything, every positional nystagmus is, is peripheral, it's due to BPPV, which is not true. Be cautious, be careful, consider the possibility of something central when you see positional downbeat, when you see positional apogeotropic nystagmus, at least consider the possibility that that could be central. Um, and I don't have time for this. I will conclude. <sighs> Take home points. The ocular motor examination is extremely helpful and it cannot be overlooked. You gotta check all classes of eye movements in all planes. If you don't check vertical saccades, you'll miss that patient with the rostral interstitial medial longitudinal vesiculus syndrome. This allows for localization clues to the etiology Remove fixation when possible to accentuate vestibular nystagmus. The pen light cover test can be done if you don't have any fancy equipment. And the, the biggest point I wanna make here with a good history, ocular motor exam, vestibular exam, the diagnosis can almost always be made at the bedside. The lab testing is really going to confirm that diagnosis. Thank you for your time and attention. All the videos that I showed here and, and many more can be found in my collection and I will stop sharing. Thank you for your time.